Thank you very much to the disembodied voice. <laughs> um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all here. Thank you all so very much for supporting the very first of our Oxford Schmidt AI in Science annual events. And we've got a wonderful lineup of um, really amazing speakers uh, this evening who are going to tell us about their work, their thoughts about AI, but also importantly, how it is accelerating, augmenting, and transforming the science they do. Uh, that will be, we hope, lots of positives, but also you can't help but open a newspaper and hear something about some of the negative sides of AI, and that's certainly something that we will discuss in our panel as well. So it really just is for me to say welcome to you all. Thank you also very much for coming and supporting our inaugural event. I'd like to hand over to uh, Oxford's Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, Professor Patrick Grant, who will say a few words. Thank you so much. Great, thanks very much, Steve. Hello, everybody. I'm Patrick Grant. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research. Uh, welcome uh, to the Sheldonian. Uh, I'd like to particularly extend a welcome to those from outside the university have come, including some Schmidt Fellows from Imperial in Cambridge. You're, you're very welcome. And welcome to uh, everyone joining us online, uh, in particular, uh, our friends from uh, Schmidt Futures and Schmidt Science. Um, thank you very much for, for coming and hearing about this celebration of the program. So the Schmidt AI in Science Postdoctoral Fellowship Program is a generous 13 pound program funded by Eric and Wendy Schmidt Foundation that will provide 110 postdoc years of funding, which means about 50 individual fellowships within the Maths, Physical and Life Sciences Division over the next five years. Um, the program is housed in the Divisional Training Center and the individual fellows working on the programs uh, work in at least one department associated with research groups. Um, the fellowships are year by year funding, but the MPLS division has decided to, to uh, from now on, to underwrite the positions for the full, at least the full two years, which is great. A large part of what the fellows do, aside from their own research, uh, is to receive and help deliver training, both along technical lines, how to use cutting edge AI, uh, as well as also professional training about how to build their networks and their, their careers. Additionally, all the fellows are given the opportunity to become associate research fellows at Rubin College, for which we are also extremely grateful. So as part of the celebration, we're going to have a plenary talk, which will be delivered by Professor Charlotte Dean. So Charlotte is the Professor of Structural Bioinformatics in the Department of Statistics here in the university, uh, where she also co-directs the Systems Approaches to Biomedical Research Center for Doctoral Training. In January of this year, Charlotte became the executive chair of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. I think we are incredibly fortunate to have one of our own in such a senior position in the UK funding landscape. And if you have any problem with end of financial year surpluses, Charlotte, you know where to come. Um, before that, amazing CV that Charlotte has. Before that, she was the chief AI officer at Accenture a biotechnology company with 450 employees where she led its comp computational scientific development. Uh, in the university, she's had lots of roles before she went to EPSRC, including being the head of the Department of Statistics and the deputy head of the Mathematical, Physical and Life Sciences Division, which is a job I also had at one time uh, just before Charlotte. She served on SAGE, the UK's scientific advisory group for emergencies during the COVID-19 pandemic, and for that and many other things, she received the member of the Order of the British Empire for her services to the COVID-19 research. Her own research, which she still manages to find time for, focuses on the development of novel, novel algorithms, tools, and databases, and she's a passionate believer in making such tools and databases available to the community. Charlotte, it's a great privilege to be able to say welcome back to Oxford and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Thank you. I'm sort of hoping magically, I don't know, shall I try next? Yeah, we'll go with that. So, good evening, everyone. It's a massive 
pleasure to be here. It's actually quite intimidating as well, standing up in Sheldonia, but it's really nice. I'm going to try and talk today about kind of machine learning is great. We hear about it all the time. We hear about AI. We're seeing the differences it makes to everything that is happening. I'm going to try and through three short stories, both show you that it's really good at things and it does some really bad things too. But in every case where it does something that we don't want it to do, it is not AI's fault. And I kind of want to emphasize that because the way these things are usually written, we usually talk about the failure of the computation. No, it's people. When these things fail, it is because the humans using them have not thought enough about how they use them or have not understood enough about what these things do. And because it's my kind of research area, I'm afraid that what we're now going to talk about is drugs. So I work on kind of trying to do the design of novel therapeutics. And usually when I say drugs, I'm hoping in your head, all your brains went to the kind of packets on the left here. If they went anywhere else, don't tell anyone else who's sitting next to you. So you've got drugs. And when I think about drugs, I actually think more about the things on the right. So I think about those are pictures of very small molecules, which will interact with the various kind of components within your body to have an effect or a function. Or at the top there, those are antibodies. So Humira there, that's probably, I think still is, the most profitable drug in the world. It's an antibody, which is for treating arthritis. Um, so both these types of drugs are really important. And the really kind of reason that this is a really good area to work on computationally is, it turns out making good drugs is really hard. So the average cost of getting a drug through to market, something like two and a half billion pounds. Average length of time, 10 years, 15 years, depends exactly how you estimate it. And the fact across the bottom is probably the scariest one. So loads of these things fail all the way through this process, right from the very first idea people might have during those 10 years. But even the drugs that get to the stage where I'm going to put them in a person, so that is the beginning of clinical trials, nine out of 10 of those will not make it to something that will actually be used as a drug, which means we don't know how to do this. You'll hear people say we can do, we can make drugs. Well, we can, but if I told you that nine out of 10 of the cars that a human got in then immediately crashed into a wall, you would decide that we didn't know how to make cars. So if we think in those terms, we haven't got this. So we really need to improve our ability to be able to do this. So what is a drug? What are we actually trying to make? It's a substance, and primarily here, I'm gonna talk about two types of substances that it has a physiological effect. So it does something when I give it to you. So I give it to you and something happens. Hopefully in most of these cases, a good thing. So if you take a headache drug, you're expecting it to make your headache go away. And it does that usually by binding into another molecule in your body. In this case, I'm showing you a small molecule binding into a protein. So yellow bit there, small molecule, red and blue stuff, the protein. Now the issue is that not only does it have to do that, so bind, but it also has to be safe. There's no good giving you a drug if it also binds to loads of your other proteins. So yes, you don't have a headache, but your leg fell off. Not a good drug. It's no good giving you a drug if I give you a drug and it would work apart from the fact that it goes through your stomach and your stomach acid destroys it. Not a good drug because it never gets to where it needs to get to. So designing a drug is about this massive multi-optimization process, making sure all of those properties will work at once and at the same time. Now, because I'm gonna talk about two different types of drugs, I'm just gonna show you a second picture, which is almost exactly the same. Probably isn't in your eyes, it is in mine. So here, my target is now that green protein you can see there, and the binding thing to it, that blue and purple thing, is an antibody. So antibodies are actually something you naturally make in your body, which protects you from many, many diseases. I used to have spent a very long time explaining antibodies, and then this big pandemic thing happened, and everybody saw them on the TV. So now I can just go, antibodies, good, look after you. But we can also turn them into drugs and do exactly the same thing, make them bind to other proteins, and create kind of useful medications that will help. So the first story I'm going to tell you about is about antibodies. So one of the things you might want to understand if you were kind of designing an antibody is which part of the antibody actually binds to my target. 
Now, you might carry out experiments to do that, but that's obviously expensive. And if I want to do this lots and have lots of ideas, it'd be great to be able to do it on a computer. Now, that finding site, just in case I fall into sort of bad language, is called the paratope. So if I say paratope, I mean the binding bit of the antibody. Now, the fortunate bit about this, the bit that makes it a bit easier, is the binding site is pretty much always in the same place on an antibody. It's in a particular region on the top of the antibody that people call the CDRs. So in this picture here, it's on that top surface, and then I've marked out those are the different amino acids, residues that make up the binding site. And what you want is a program that can tell you which residues are involved in binding. So my group um, did this work where we said, okay, we're going to build a piece of software. It's called Paragraph. And we're going to use experimental data and model data. And we're going to take the structures of the antibodies. And we're also going to take those sequences, so just the residues that make it up. So it's a list of letters. And I'm not going to talk about any of the machine learning tools because I have got half an hour and it would take too long to explain exactly all the tests we have to run. But those of you who care, equivariant graph neural network and train this thing to then output, just tell me which residues are the binding residues. So that's the output. Now, this is a kind of standard problem. It's a great problem to do with machine learning because I know exactly what I want to do. It's a nice classification problem. Machine learning tends to be good at classification. And it's a problem people care about the answer for. And we have a reasonable amount of data to build the model. So this slide contains so many of the things that people get wrong when we do machine learning. So I could just, for the moment, ignore the top line that says baseline. All right? So our method is paragraph, and it's at the bottom there. And based on what should be the measure for telling me whether I'm doing good or not, so there's two measures there. Doesn't really matter what they're called, but PRAUC and ROC AUC, bad is zero. That means you've really got everything wrong. In fact, you've managed to reverse your predictions. One would be perfect. Shouldn't really, so the first important thing is loads of people only report the second one of those measures, which you shouldn't use. And it's a very simple piece of statistics here. I feel I have to say it, even though no one in this audience will probably care. If you have a very large number of things which are not binding residues, and that's fairly obvious here. Most things are not binding residues. There's a very small number that are. If I predict everything to be not binding, I'm quite accurate, surprisingly enough, because like 95% of things are not binding. Turns out this very standard measure that everyone uses goes, ooh, and gives you a really good score. So ignore that column, apart from the fact that it's in everybody's papers. The other measure is better. Now, the previous methods, so there's three previous methods there running from the, I'm not going to say, Dabba, Daku, Parapred, and Pecan. And paragraph at the bottom, we are the best. So I could have gone, excellent, I have the best predicting method, publish it, everyone is happy. I now want you to look at that line across the top. Because what's happening there is we did a really, really simple thing. We took the training data that was used for all these methods, so just that training data, and we just counted, literally counting, how often a given position, a given residue was in the binding site or not. And we used that as the score on the test set. And you can see that it actually performed better than the machine learning methods that were developed in 2019. And actually, it's not that far off performing as well as you know, the, what we consider to be the best in class now. And this is, I think, one of those really kind of interesting things. Yes. Paragraph is good. And if we expand its data set, give it more training data, it does better. That's the sort of orange stuff across the bottom there. But something we always need to remember, and I kind of call it the idiot test, but what I meant to call it is the baseline method, is what would you do if you weren't using a clever computational tool? How good is that, given the volume of data that you're giving to these methods and giving everything else that is sitting there? And very frequently, we have found it is way better than most of the very, very fancy algorithms people have written. And I kind of sort of scream this out everywhere. And obviously, we've done it here for a particular case. But every time, think about how much electricity is being used when we train these methods. They should be a lot better than just counting. And if they're not, we need to think very hard about why we're trying to use them. 
So on to the second story. I'm going to talk about language models, so large language models. I have this understanding that pretty much everybody in the room is going to have read at least one new story about them. I decided to go for many variants here. So very, very recent article from the FT about thinking that the open AI and meta large language models are going to be capable of reasoning. I particularly liked the, um, I used chat GPT to go on hundreds of Tinder dates. I'm still not quite sure how you do that, but because I didn't actually read the article, I just liked the headline. Um, and then you have the worry, will these methods have effects on our kind of election results? So people, you know, Google is saying it's going to restrict the use of its model Gemini around the times of elections, and others are talking about similar things. But then we also know that if we use these things really well, if you like look on the top right, I mean, it's clear that these methods can actually do incredible things in terms of being able to predict things like helping people with depression or working out, I mean, they can pass most of the basic exams that I suspect you, like me, spent quite a lot of time trying to get through. You know, they made me study for like four years to get a degree here. And I could have just been GPT-4, would have been way better. So this is clearly a really powerful technique in natural language. So one of the questions we asked ourselves was, well, is it a powerful technique if we move it into the biological realm? Now, fortunately, Facebook had done a lot of that work before us. So those of you who work in this kind of realm will be aware that Facebook built some very powerful models which were about this kind of protein sequence problem. So we asked, well, could we make it specific? And we thought about antibody sequences as a language. So the way a large language model is working is you give it loads and loads, if we're thinking about the ones in sort of natural languages, loads and loads and loads of, we'll start with English, loads of sentences and you can tokenize it usually by the words and then what it learns to do is effectively how it's trained is you delete a word from it and you ask it to tell you what that word should have been and that's the basic training for a large language model so we can kind of do the same thing with an antibody sequence so the antibody sequence is here i've got the sort of two paths of it so they're called vh and vl but it doesn't really matter they're made up of these amino acids so now the token is a single letter there are 20 possible letters and you can train a model in very much the same way. And the cool thing is that there's a lot of data for antibodies for many, many reasons. So my group collects a lot of this data. We have a database called the Observed Antibody Space. And there's about two and a half billion sequences in that. Now that's not the scale of the data that we have for English language processing, but it is an enormous amount of data where you could start to build these language models. Now there's one more thing I want you to notice on this slide and it's a little bit of biology, I'm afraid. So I've drawn the picture there on the right-hand side showing you kind of how the sequence patterns for the antibodies work. That's kind of their sequences. And they're built, just like every protein in your body is built, they're built from genes. So there is a set of, they're called V genes, J genes, and D genes, but think about the V gene because it's most of it. So the antibody, it starts off, there is, an, there is a set of V genes, and the amino acids will look exactly like that originally. And then antibodies mutate them a bit to make them bind to the things that are of interest. But the starting patterns are set by those V genes. It's incredibly well understood biology. We know this. Turns out we don't pay enough attention to things that we know. So we built a language model. It was one of the very first antibody language models. So you train it with that data and then you can use it to do various things. The thing we mostly used it for was exactly what it was trained for, which is if I delete some residues, what would be good residues to put in those places. So imagine it's a bit like improving your sentence, going, I don't really like the way this reads, and then asking it to, can you make this read a bit more smoothly? Could you make it slightly better? And there have been lots of papers published about how you can use these language models to improve the properties of your antibody. So by doing exactly that, changing the residues. And then we looked at something which, you know, sort of sounds, it, it's one of those things where once you've done it, everyone goes, oh, that's obvious. But of course, I can tell you that there are ooh, probably hundreds of papers in the literature which have used both our lang antibody language model and others, using them to improve the properties of antibodies. And then we showed this, and it's, this is very obvious once I explain. So what I'm doing here is across the bottom there, there are two sequences. If you look at the top one first, that is actually a COVID antibody. So it's actually an antibody many of you may have in your system because I suspect most of you have had COVID. Um, but it's one of the response antibodies people have to COVID. Yep. And colored in the kind of blue colors on that sequence are where the CDRs are. 
Okay, so that's that hypervariable bit. And then underneath it is the V gene for that sequence. So it's got some changes from the V gene and we've colored those. Those are where the red residues are along there. So if I go, I don't know, sort of halfway along, there is a, a red S. Yep. And it wouldn't be an S if the V gene had stayed exactly the same. So now we ask a really simple question. All I've done is I've asked the model to tell me what residue should be in each of these positions. Yep. And this is the scary bit. At every position where you can see it's red, the model immediately says, oh, and it puts it back to germline. So it has no idea about moving it away from the V gene. Now, if you're thinking in terms of natural language, this is a beautiful property. Because what that means is, you know, normally there's a the here in the sentence, so I'm going to put a the here in the sentence. What this means for antibodies is, of course, I could have done that without a really big language model because I could have just put the V gene there and then gone, oh, that's normally an S in the gene, so I'll tell it to make an S. And that's actually quite problematic because that means I'm not, I haven't really learned anything very exciting at all. I have learned the basic biology inside your body, which I could have written down and has been known for many, many, many years. And just to show that's not a one-off, what we're showing here is non-germline residue means it's a position that shouldn't be the thing that was in the gene. So it should change it. And you can see that all of the language models pretty much predict the germline the entire time. So that's wrong every single time. And it doesn't matter how many mutations they've got, they just keep doing that. Now you might notice that ESM, now that's a general protein model. So the others are all very specific for antibodies. This one doesn't do quite the same thing. Amazingly though, it still does it 50% of the time. So basically every model has this huge bias towards just telling me what I already knew. It has no, it doesn't go anywhere else, which, you know, I probably could have saved a big electricity bill. And for some of these, a very big electricity bill in terms of training them. And what well, does it matter? Well, it matters because what we want to use these models for, particularly with my group, but groups around the world and in pharmaceutical companies is to design therapeutics. And turns out, and these graphs are just to kind of give you an idea of this, therapeutics have lots of these, so NGL, non-germline residues, way, way more than natural antibodies. So if what I'm doing is optimizing my antibody towards being a therapeutic by turning it back into something which is very non-therapeutic-like, it's quite natural, but it's not very useful to us. But this is an entirely expected property. I'm sort of disappointed in myself, which is why I think I'm allowed to tell this story because I'm not talking about everybody else, though to be fair, everybody missed it, which is of course, as I said, if you're working in natural language, that is the process you want. You want to go to that kind of what we've seen loads of times, every time we see it, we want to do the same thing. Because you don't want it to make up imaginary words. You want it to do sensible, create sensible sentences. But of course, the vast majority of antibodies have very few mutations away from germline because your naive antibodies just look like your genes. So it's doing exactly what it should do based on the data we have given it. And of course, it's exactly what we don't want it to do if we're actually going to use it to generate novel therapeutics. So the data we input is skewed towards those germlines. So it could be useful if what I want to do is make something look really natural, so make it look human. Now that's a good property, because if I inject you with a non-human protein, that's very, very bad for you in case you're wondering. So actually keeping these things human is quite important. But it's very kind of problematic if we, what we want to do is create a model that actually is gonna help us design a better therapeutic, because we've actually trained it almost exactly against type by accident. I'm now going to show you two really boring tables. I'm going to try and make them interesting as I do it. Boring table one. Those people who care about lots of numbers to do with um, large language models can pay attention to all the numbers on here. The rest of you, don't worry about any of it. But basically, at the top are the original models, and at the bottom was us trying to work out how could you possibly change a language model so that it would actually pay attention to the, if you like, rarer events. And it turned out that there was already a very well-known mathematical solution to this. It's something called focal loss. But it wasn't something anybody used because nobody wanted the rarer words to pop up much more frequently or them to be the important thing in what you were doing. But actually, if we're thinking about 
biology, there are many times when biology has a very sort of conserved, consistent way of doing things. And what we're really interested in are the tiny changes and the unusual things. And actually, I think that will be true across many science questions. It's one of the reasons why lots of the things that are built for kind of, if you like, general purpose, and we get very excited about them and say, I'll bring that piece of machine learning into using it for what I do in science, may not be that perfect fit because our questions are slightly different. So boring table two. So same list of models. Now, the number I'm showing you here is something called perplexity. I like this name. I don't completely understand why it's called perplexity, but I like it. So it spans from one. What one means is I've predicted the right residue in that spot. In theory, it goes out to infinity. In practice, it should only go to about 20 here because it can only get it wrong 20 times because there are only 20 amino acids. If you look at what's happening here, if we have the germline residues, these models are actually very good at that. It's easy, they get it right. If we look at the non-germline residues, I love the fact that loads of these models go over 20 here because they, they are so much worse than random, it's painful. Yep, they, they literally, and um, the reason actually behind that is because they're very, very strongly predicting germline, which is absolutely definitely wrong. And what we did by slowly changing and building the model is try not to damage our ability to predict germline residues, but give it some ability to predict the non-germline residues. Now notice that I'm not at one on that side either, but and this is quite a big but here, I don't want to be at one either. Because if there was only one residue possible at that position, if I just masked it and got back what I already knew, that wouldn't be very helpful. What I want to get back are possibilities at that position. So I would like to see some variation. Probably not as much as I still have there. But you can see how you can drive these models into being useful once you start thinking about the exact problem you're working on and exactly what the data looks like that you are using. So my final story, I'm going to talk about docking. So this is back to the kind of small molecules, so little molecules binding into the protein. And there has been a huge amount of fuss about this. So Predicting whether a molecule will bind in the pocket of a protein is obviously the first thing you need a drug to do is bind to its target. And there have been a lot. And some of them are papers. Some of them are what I would call press releases, by which I mean archive papers. Some of them are, you know, kind of worse than that. They're kind of, I put up a website and I'm a genius and these news people are talking about it. But there's been a lot of noise about how we can do this. Machine learning has solved this problem. We can predict how a small molecule will bind to a protein. And I did the classic thing, and I'm, if any other supervisors in the room will have done exactly this, students and postdocs, this will have happened to you. You walk into a meeting with your supervisor and they go, I've seen all this stuff about how they can do this now. Could you possibly go away and work out if you can do this now and make all these programs work on our computers so we can use them? And Martin was the unfortunate student in my group to whom this happened. And he trotted off and then came back and said, I don't, I don't think this works quite right. And I went, well, you're going to have to do a little bit better than I just don't think this works quite right. So we had this kind of ongoing conversation for a few weeks. And I guess it was kind of this kind of picture that convinced me. So those of you who aren't chemists won't be able to see quite how funny this is. Those of you who are chemists are probably already cringing and wanting to dig your nails into your hand or something. So across the top is a measure of whether they've got it right or not, which is called RMSD. Doesn't really matter. These are all considered to be reasonably good predictions by these models. So they would say, we've got this. Right? I'm not even showing you the protein because it gets worse if I do that, but I'm just showing you the small molecule. If you look at the one which says 2.2 at the top, that's the easiest one to see. The right answer is at the bottom. Yep. That's not a good piece of chemistry. Those of you who can't tell that, that, that everything's a bit too close together, a bit squished, a bit very, very wrong. So if the method is producing that, it is not working. It is producing something that is completely non-physical. Now, the reason it's doing that is it doesn't know any physics, so why does it have to retain physical rules? Yep, it's been trained, told that its measure is get a low RMSD. It does, and it goes, well, I've done that. What's your problem? And then you just go and look, and you go, hmm, that's really not good. 
So we decided to say, well, could we check how often this is happening? Is this kind of just us being a bit mean and there are a few couple of cases, or is this actually some kind of problem we really need to think about? So we generated, we, we called it Pose Busters because really you've got to when you're doing this kind of thing. And it's, I'm just going to show you some very basic results from it. But we tested it on a couple of different data sets to keep everybody happy. Um, what we did was we used some what are called classical docking methods. So things, there's auto.vena and gold. Those are basically using a physics-based energy function to try and solve this problem. So you go, here's the protein, here's the small molecule. Using your relatively poor, let's be honest, approximation of physics, try and work out how it will fit in there. Yep. And then the others are deep learning based. So I go, here's the protein, here's the molecule, do whatever you're doing with your fancy deep learning and put it in the right place in the pocket. And we deliberately picked things which had different kind of methodologies sitting underneath them. Those of you who care, they've got different types of diffusion models or they're based on different types of neural networks, that kind of thing. And then all we did was built a really simple test suite which just said, okay, how often is this chemically and physically plausible? Yep, as well as preferably getting the right answer. And that, you just think, well, surely most of it must be. It would be insane to generate a program that is doing what is a physical process and generate things that are, you know, completely physically implausible. It's terrifying. So classical methods on the left-hand side there. Solid bars are how well you do getting, and we've just got a, a, a cutoff for a right answer, it doesn't really matter, but right answer, and it is physically valid. So even using those methods, sometimes they generate things that are a bit, and that's not a surprise, you know, they're an approximation of physics, they're trying to make this thing dock, and so sometimes you will get slightly odd answers. Then you go to the deep learning based methods, and I'm gonna look at diff dock primarily, so that's about halfway across. Um, I'm picking on it because it was the first of the methods to say, we are definitely better than anything else out there. We are awesome. And on the one hand, it is awesome because if you look at how well it does on the green data set, I'll explain the difference between green and red in a minute. It is actually, if you look at the hashed part of that, which is I got it right, but I don't care if it's physically plausible. Yeah, it's better. But if you start asking, are you actually making physically plausible answers, you can see it loses about 30% of its accuracy. So 30% of the cases are gone. Now this gets even worse. So the green data set, which is the one that everyone's been using to test on, is actually, and once again, I will feel the wince from everybody who works on computational methods, is all contained within the training data. So if you don't get that right, your method is really not very good because it hasn't even learned what you've told it. So it's not surprising it does that well. We actually generated the red data set, which we called the pose buster set, because we're very imaginative, where we attempted just to have a set. It's not very hard. I'm not claiming this is a difficult set, but it isn't exactly the same thing that's in that set that was in the training. So some of them are still quite easy because they're very similar, but you know they are different. So immediately, I wipe out almost all the performance of loads of these deep learning methods. So it goes from 72% to 38% just by being careful about your train test validation splits. And then it's even worse because on things it hasn't seen before, its physics gets even worse than it was before. And you can see it's down at like 14% of things are correct. Whereas the classical methods, about 50%. So no, these methods don't yet outperform the classical docking methods. But, and we should be really fair here, that's still quite clever because it's actually very hard to do this. And they've got very limited training data to do it on. And if you do want to do things that are very similar, maybe they're still really useful. Just to kind of hammer home that similarity point, because the train test validation split is probably the biggest problem in the literature for machine learning, in the sense that people are just not very careful about it. So this is that Postbusters set. So the one that I said was a bit harder, still not that hard. And what we've done is we split it into three bins going from orange, which is basically a really easy case because it's very similar to something that was in the training, to yellow, to something that's kind of, eh, it's quite difficult, a bit different, to the kind of very light yellow. I'm trying to see the colors on there. They do kind of show. Um, which is, it's really different, so this is quite hard. Now, what you notice is the classical methods don't care. Yep, they're about the same across all three bins. 
But if I now look at, I'm sorry, I'm picking on DiffDoc again, it feels mean. Um, if I look at DiffDoc again, if something is very similar, yep, 50% of the time, it would give you something that was approximately in the right place, but only half of those would actually be physically plausible, so useful to you. And then if you give it something which is not similar, well, it's less than 1%. So it basically does not generate anything which you could use as a sensible doc. And it is these kinds of things that are really important because you may only care about things that are really similar and the method is powerful there. So use it. Yep, that's, this is not a kind of, it's terrible. It is thinking about where these things are useful. And I should just say for completeness now, DiffDoc have released a new version where they claim to do much better than this. I'm just gonna leave that there. They claim to do much better than this. So I'm just gonna finish up now. I hope, um, I've kind of told you a lot about the pitfalls, but I'm hoping you're kind of seeing the power that's there as well. These are literally algorithms where we're just giving them great big tons of data and saying, do something which we have been struggling with as scientists with really complicated mathematical functions, ideas, stats, thinking about properties to do the prediction of. And actually they already show enormous promise to do various ones of these techniques. And every single time the problem is not with that algorithm doing something wrong, it is thinking about how would you use the data properly? Do we have enough data to even think about doing this? And how do we assess whether it's doing what I want? Because it's very easy to get carried away and go, oh, I must use a large language model in my work because then everyone will em employ me. That might be true. But you probably don't actually want to do that. You want to think about how do I solve the problem that is sitting in front of me and which ones of the techniques that are available will help me do that and where do I have enough data that will make that possible. And this is actually a quote from one of my students when they were complaining about trying to fight about getting various things which being published because our headline numbers didn't look as good as everyone else's. And they walked into my office and pretty much screamed in my face, hype brings you money and fame. Realism is boring. So I apologize because I think I am a born realist, but I think that particularly in the world that we're now sitting in with AI, realism is incredibly important. So I should just finish by saying a massive thank you to my research group. So they're over on the right-hand side there on the only dry day on our retreat, I shouldn't say even day, dry hour on our retreat um, when we all went away together. Um, I've included this photo as well because I've been talking about lots of work through my group through time. So that was when a lot of my group came back to visit about a year ago. And then I will finish as I always do, which is actually to say a massive thank you to all those organizations across the bottom because they literally give me money so I can do something I massively enjoy. Thank you very much. Charlotte, thank you so much for such an inspiring talk. Um, I guarantee there's a few questions. I know you're happy to take some. Um, if people could just uh, put their hand up. Um, we have a few roving microphones. Um, Jim. Charlotte, one of the things about DeepMind is that it, hidden underneath it, uh, there are some of these physical laws pushed into it uh, in, in AlphaFold. You know, that it, it's not just, uh, you know, machine learning. There is physics in it. So presumably in DefDoc and these other machine learning programs, you could in fact program them to be physically realistic yeah. since we know what they are. So this is one of those interesting things. One, I mean, I didn't have time to share everything. One of the things we did was we took the results from DiffDoc and then just did a simple minimization on them. So sometimes that doesn't fit. I mean, problems like rings going through, it doesn't fix, but it fixes things. The interesting thing, though, is what actually happens is they're still slightly worse than the traditional ones, but now they're incredibly computationally expensive because they're already computationally expensive, these methods, and then I have to do that as well. So then I just run the normal one because it's, it costs less money, basically, and, you know, money being computational time at that point. I think that one of the most, I mean, interesting things is where you build the physical rules as what are called constraints within the program itself. So we have several techniques where we have built that. The issue around doing that, and it's sort of a win-lose thing. The brilliant thing about doing that is it fixes lots, you know, the physics problems I talked about there. The sad thing about doing that is it means that the methods don't get past that point when we know that our understanding of the physical rules as we put them in isn't perfect, 
because otherwise all those kinds of simulations and things would be right and they're not. So it's a kind of game about how much you want to put in because putting in precise quantum mechanical physics, that's, yeah, that's a no yet. But I agree with you. And so that's one of those really interesting things. I think it's going to be a massive part of the field which is going to become where not where you do machine learning followed by whatever might be, you know, physics laws are the most obvious one, but you might have it as mathematical, you know, understanding of a simulation or whatever. Um, but instead, those are conditioning properties within the model itself. Um, there's somebody here. Thank you for the talk. I really appreciate seeing people talk about problems in machine learning models because it's not really, I think, covered up in the literature. So I guess this is more of a general question. How would you attempt to motivate more transparent communication and science on the usage of machine learning models and the failures that people experience while using them? So I think part of that is this whole, we are at a point where everyone's trying to do something very, very fast. And whenever people are trying to go fast, they tend to not be careful. I just think of real life. When I'm going fast, it's not as careful as when I'm going slow. I think the importance of one of the reasons I stand up and talk about this stuff, even you know, all over the place, is because what I'm actually trying to do is convince every one of you, when you get a paper to review, to actually look at it and go, have they baselined properly? Where has their data come from? What is their train test validation split? And not just read the headline and go, wow, that's cool. Because it might well truly be cool as well. Those are not mutually exclusive. It is not bad that some of these methods are not perfect yet, but we need to understand their limitations. So I think the first step is that key step. And my kind of, I don't know, the, the way I think about this sort of backwards is the there was a period of time where if you were publishing medical studies, you got away without having to think about things like p-values correctly and you know, understanding what I would call basic statistics. That's not true anymore because the community has, I mean, it's not perfect, nowhere's perfect, but reviewing papers in that kind of area and the way those things are done, everybody thinks about that. And when stuff comes through that isn't done properly, everyone goes, oh, the stats are wrong. Yep, or they go and get a statistician to look at it to check whether they're right. And I think we're at the phase where we need to start saying that out loud, that that level of checking is something that we have to impose so that it just becomes second nature, and it will. I mean, maybe I'm also an optimist as well as a realist, these things will get better, but they will only get better if we take responsibility for making it so. Uh, there's uh, somebody in a green shirt just back there. Um, hi. Uh, I'm wondering, can you comment on how much better, if you want to use the word better, is something currently done in silico, like the language models and predictions and algorithm, compared to biological experiments? It's a, it's a very difficult comparison because often a computational model does not give you exactly the same information you would get from a kind of a biological experiment. So the kind of first case study I use there is a really good way of explaining this. I'm trying with the computer because I can to predict exactly where the binding site is. To get that level of information would require me actually in the experimental terms to solve a structure of the complex between the antibody and its target. That is a very expensive experiment and takes a long time. And it's one of the easy, you know, antibodies one of the easiest things to do structures of. But so the computer even being slightly rubbish is a massive time saving because it gives you an idea of why that's happening. Now you can compare it to other types of experiment where you might check whether two things get in each other's way when they bind. So if, if this binds here and this binds here, they can't bind at the same time. But that doesn't really tell me exactly where the binding site is. It kind of sort of tells me. So I think we always have to be careful with that comparison. At the moment, what we think about, what I think about with computational models, and I think it pulls through into sort of the stuff that's done in kind of, if you like, the way we might use AI in a normal lifestyle thing is, what it is is it's an addition to how we would do things and a time saver for decision making as we do it and changes how we do it. In the end, I mean, clearly I do all of this because I think in the end one day I'll push a button and it will tell me what drug to make and we'll be done. But that's probably still quite a long way off. Uh, thanks for that talk, it was excellent. Um, so one of the reasons I think that your group can spot these things, the problems with these methods, is because you have been, you were an expert in this area before you started using machine learning techniques, using statistics and so on. Is it the case that some of the groups developing these techniques don't have that true understanding of the science and therefore miss some of these problems? 
Could you repeat the yeah. question, please? So it's just being asked whether one of the reasons that these techniques, quite often with machine learning techniques, is the reason that we have problems because you have people developing them who are not experts in, say, the scientific area that they're working against. And that's quite likely. I mean, you know, if I try to do things that were related to, I don't know, actually natural language processing, even though I can, in theory, write down the mathematics of a transformer of a large language model, I understand how they work, I understand all of that, I am sure I would not be great at it because I won't think about the issues that might arise from doing that kind of thing. And you're always going to have that in areas where something is hot. I don't know if that's the appropriate term, but when people are really excited about an area, loads of people head towards it. Now, there are the downside of that, I guess, is what's been said, which is this idea that, of course, then you have people who go, I understand anything about how the computer works and the machine learning, I can just take this data set and I can do brilliantly and look amazing, and they make a lot of mistakes. The upside of that for someone like me is there are now loads of people interested in the problems I work on, and it's really exciting. And it is an opportunity to work out how you can help those people understand those things. You know, I need to be helped to understand many, many, many things. And so I think it's fair to be expected to educate others where I might be someone who knows a bit more. Charlotte, can you comment on how much you think the community is aware of the limitations of the data we have? Because we have so many people coming in with interesting mathematical new models without looking carefully what they're working on. Uh, I, I, I mean, personally, I think certainly in the areas I work on, but I think in many areas, our biggest limitation is data. It's both the quality of the data, the volume of the data, the way the data might be annotated, our understanding of what that data even means, you know, and then actually quite frequently, if we're talking about experimental data, how it has to be somehow processed before I can even use it to turn it into something I can input. And I think, I think now actually that awareness is growing very, very fast, that most people are starting to understand these problems. We don't necessarily understand how to fix them, but now when I start talking about the fact that machine learning grade data is something that, you know, if, if you really wanted to change our ability to predict binding of small molecules to proteins, if I had infinitely deep pockets, I'd just go and collect a really large data set. Because I think that the promise we see within the computational methodology is so high now, that if you had a very large data set, actually you could do some very powerful things with no more of the kind of that side. Now, that's not true everywhere, but I, I think now that awareness is really growing. And I think it's a, we don't know how to fix it. And lots of people aren't prepared to go and collect the data that's required. They're just sort of expecting someone else to magically do it for them. But I think at least that idea is in people's minds. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I want to get back to the conversation around uh, physics, adding physics to the machine learning models. There's a lot of thoughts given to that, and you mentioned some of the work that's on it. But it seems that it's always in this direction. It's like we've got physical models, and they generalize quite well, and then we throw it all out, throw a big fancy machine learning model, and then we're like, ah, doesn't work very well. Let's, let's add some physics back in. But is as much thought given to let's start with the thing that kind of works and where, where is the first point of failure and what kind of machine learning can apply, even if it's not the most hype? So, I mean, that definitely already happened. So the kind of classical scoring functions I was showing you there, so the classical docking methods, um, some of those now have on the front end of them might not you know, it's not fancy deep learning, but machine learning methods that help them build that kind of scoring package and make decisions there. And you're going to see those drivers from both directions. Because obviously, if you come at this as a machine learning person, you go, obviously, I start with the shiny, shiny toy. And then I go, as you say, ah, and then I try and learn something else that will make my shiny, shiny toy better. If you come from the other side and you've spent, you know, your entire universe time trying to write the best possible molecular dynamics simulation methodology, you come at it with that and you go, and it's really slow and it doesn't always do the things I want it to do, how could I incorporate? So uh, these combinations of ways of thinking, I mean, the phrase I always use is I see just machine learning AI as another toy on my shelf. It's another thing that I can use to try and answer questions I really care about. At the moment, it's everyone's favorite toy. But as we all know, as we grow up, change is a favorite toy. So it will change. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you.
So um, after Charlotte's uh, wonderful talk, we're now going to have a panel discussion. Um, for those who didn't get a chance to ask some questions just now, there'll be time after the panel discussion to ask questions, either of Charlotte or any of our panelists. So maybe I'd just like to ask um, Neil, Louise, to come on up. Charlotte, I'm afraid you're back up again. So as well as um, the three wonderful panelists who I'm going to get to introduce themselves, at least Neil Lawrence and Louise Slater, because we've had an introduction to Charlotte. I also, in my pocket, um, have some answers from one of the world's favorite large language models. And I think it'd be very interesting to see how well our expert AI scientists do compared to a large language model. <laughs> so might I start with you, Neil, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, your passion for AI and science. So uh, I'm Neil Lawrence. I'm a professor of machine learning at the University of Cambridge, where I lead the flagship mission on AI there. I guess I've been doing machine learning for almost as long as Stephen has. He was already a, a, a known person in the field, so, and that's about 27 years. I don't like the term AI. I think it misleads. I think it, these are incredible technologies, and you would understand them much better. Everything Charlotte said, people would sort of realize much better if you say, oh, it's machine learning. It's not doing sort of intelligence. But it's the term we sort of now have. Um, and I do think that there's incredible possibilities, as Charlotte outlined, with these techniques. Um, and it's so exciting to hear from her because my own history in deploying these techniques was basically starting trying to work them in computational biology uh, for about 20 years, where I think many of the lessons that Charlotte's talked about are hard learned. Pastor um, Louise. Thank you very much for that fantastic talk. Um, my name is Louise Slater. I'm a professor of hydroclimatology here in the geography department in Oxford. And I lead a group here called Hydroclimate Extremes, which works on um, understanding how extreme climate and climate impacts are evolving over time, whether that's floods, droughts, extreme temperature and precipitation. And, and the group uses um, ML, AI methods in a range of areas. Don't think I should say any more words. <laughs> I'm a large language model. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question, Louise, might I start with you, um, would be to think about the state of the art in the effective use of AI for science. Um, we'll start with that. What, what are your thoughts about the effective use of AI, or maybe we should say data-driven machine learning, in the science that you do? So in my area at the moment, um, the, I'd say the state of the art in terms of global prediction of um, weather, climate, and climate impacts is at the moment most people are using large global neural networks. Um, I think many people in this room are probably familiar with the Graphcast paper um, by Lamital that came out last year in Science, which was the first to really demonstrate that we could build these global ML-based um, weather prediction systems that were comparable to and even outperformed the classical um, forecasting systems that we have at the European Weather Centre just down the road in Reading, um, European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And, um, and similarly, in flood prediction, we have a paper, I realise this is a bit close, a paper that came out uh, about 10 days ago, um, led by the Google team, Graineering at Google Research, um, in hydrology, which is about flood prediction and showing that we can now generate predictions of um, floods in one to seven days ahead, sim a bit similar to the Lamadal paper, which was up to 10 days ahead, um, trained on reanalysis data and allowing us to generate very accurate predictions of flood magnitudes, including the most extreme floods um, with high return periods. Um, and, and this is really where the, the field is going now at the moment, is training these large neural network type models on our reanalysis data and a range of other types of data. Um, and this is similar to the kinds of things that we're doing in the group as well. So um, in terms of generating these, these global data sets, training them on reanalysis, on climate model outputs, on sometimes satellite images, um, on a, a variety of ground-based observations as well. So um, it's bringing all of this together is what people are doing at the moment. And, I 
there's, there's so many different fields where this all links together. It's the area of hybrid forecasting as well, which is all about bringing together the dynamical models and the machine learning models as well. And before I move on to, to ask Neil a little bit about this, um, can I just ask, in your field, do you see phenomena similar to those that, that Charlotte has um, highlighted where there is a mismatch between quoted performance of computational models and real world impact and performance? I, I think it's one of the big challenges now is we have this, um, you can get very high performance, but not necessarily for the right reasons. And this is one thing that I think many people are not aware of when, when we're, um, when we're doing the evaluation of how the models perform, unless you're using the right metrics and you're really looking at why they're obtaining um, such performance and biases and where the biases occur, you don't necessarily understand whether your model is appropriate. Um, so, for instance, it's not just about the overall biases of a model, it's where do we find those biases. So, in our case, we're looking at global predictions and you might find overall fantastic performance, but if you don't dig into um, how, how do the biases vary in space? Is it in the large river catchments? Is it the largest floods that are performing less well for this particular type of event? Unless you really dig in to, to the performance and the different types of biases in different parts of the landscape, you won't understand, for instance, that, I don't know, coastal predictions are failing this time of the year. Or, and so the point that you made in your talk about slow science and actually taking the time to understand where the biases are. This is what I think is, is the problem with, with rushed fast science is that we don't necessarily dig into that enough. Neil, if I may um, come to you next. We've heard very eloquently from um, two of our speakers about the mismatch between real world performance and impact and the kind of performance and impact we often see as headlines in academic and, and other uh, publications, what could and perhaps should be done to modify our algorithms to meet the future needs of science? Well, I thought Charlotte did a really good job of characterizing the breadth and scope of the problems. And it was, as, as I was listening to her speak, it, it's almost like what you're hearing is a review of these methods from an expert driver rather than the publication from the car manufacturer. You know, and, and, and that's kind of the problem we have. All we see is people who have produced something, they say, this is the fastest thing. It's like, well, actually, maybe, maybe speed wasn't what we needed. We needed carrying capacity. Um, and of course, as we get, I mean, and just to summarize, I thought the sort of things that summarize some of those points, Charlotte talked about baseline. Always do your baseline. So this is, you also talked about it's not typically the algorithms at fault, it's the people and, and perhaps the culture. So that's number one. And, and I was talking about that with some of the students before and also with Lionel, you know, the importance about baseline. Charlotte also talked about the importance of collecting data. And I was struck by the fact that the re reason she was able to do Ablang is because you've already put so much effort into that thing that is critically important in computational biology. In many domains, that's not yet understood. Um, and I think Louise was sort of touching on, on that a bit as well. Bias towards telling us what we knew. That was an interesting one for me because it wouldn't have been one that I'd, I'd immediately realized, but it sort of makes a lot of sense. If you've got all this data in the domain, you actually can simulate, but you're actually trying to go outside that simulation. That's not great. That's the classic problem of you can interpolate, but you can't extrapolate without these models unless you bring that physical insight. And this is, of course, an area that's been studied for quite a long time, as, as has been discussed in questions as well. The importance of domain knowledge, Charlotte highlighted sort of biology versus language, and, and I think it was also in the questions, the importance of, the, if you are a domain expert in these areas and you think carefully and you proceed uh, intelligently, you're going to make good progress. Um, if you're not a domain expert in the area, you'll, you'll misjudge what the actual criteria, as Louise was also pointing out. Um, and then this thing about, um, you know, the, the poor students trying to do these things, I don't think that quite that works quite right. And the notion of money and fame, it's wasting inordinate amounts of time that we all have to go and recreate these results, first of all, and potentially chase down these phantoms because people have gone to the press before they've actually gone to a domain expert. But on the positive side, it's actually, as I think Charlotte brought out very well, it's exciting and this is a new toy. And this is almost like just injecting a bunch of noise into the system. And what we can do 
I mean, through, for example, Schmidt-funded programs and through the AI for Science Fellows and, you know, the fact that there's a program at Imperial and Oxford is we can build that community correctly. We can bring, because one of the things you notice, as we had with the sort of Fellows T earlier, is when people talk across these domains, they find all the problems are the same. And I think that's one of the great values of this program and these gettings together is that, yes, it may not be in your literature, but if we can make sure it's in the knowledge of the next generation of scientists, it doesn't make it easy, but it's kind of reassuring that everyone's suffering the same problems. Thank you. And my question is going to start by um, commenting very briefly on what our friendly large language model thinks uh, it is really good at in state of the art. I am a data powerhouse, it says. I excel at analyzing massive scientific data sets, uncovering hidden patterns and relationships that might elude human researchers, or maybe not. <laughs> I excel at drug discovery <laughs> and material science. <laughs> The third item, I actually would like to come back to you, Charlotte. Our large language model says, automating tasks. AI can handle tedious tasks like data cleaning, low-level image analysis, running simulations, freeing up scientists for more creative endeavors. What are your thoughts about claims? We hear that quite a lot, that AI will accelerate science through that. I think that there's, it's not a perfect truth, but there's a lot of truth in that. If, you know, I mean, I unfortunately don't get to spend my entire day playing on a computer, writing code and thinking about these things anymore. But when you are doing those tasks now, you can do them by, you know, you can ask the large language model if you want to set it up to run something through one piece of software, tell you what the answer is, and then put it into the next one without you reformatting the data. And that's actually a massive time saver. But it's like everything, all the problems that we, everyone has articulated so well still exist. So you don't do this in a blind way yet. If you say AI can clean data sets, I would go, no. But does AI help us? So my research group, I mentioned, observed antibody space during the talk with the two and a half billion sequences in it. But we do a lot of data set collection and building these big data sets. And we use those kinds of methods because they can really speed it up. But you still, at the moment, require humans to go and check or put lots of catches in that say, OK, if anything looks even slightly weird, show it to me, please. Um, so I think there's lots of that. I mean, the other thing I think about, which, which wasn't mentioned by our kind friend there, is one of the things it's really good at for people like me is it really helps write code. Um, I don't know how many people in the room, but it, not all of the models, but they're really quite good at this. If you go, here's my, oh, you get to them, can you, can you make that faster? Comes back. Now you have to check it's doing what you want it to do, but it can make it faster. It can um, annotate it better than I have ever bothered to. It's very good at putting comments on my code. I'm, I'm not good at that. Um, they're not always correct, but it's a good starting point. So yes, I would say this is something where you can see how large language models allow you to interface with different tools much more effectively because they're very happy in the kind of computational interface and they're giving us a natural language interface into that. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, the flip side of that, we've been talking a little bit about um, how AI maybe needs to be modified in order to work with science. The other side of that is to acknowledge that perhaps we as scientists need to modify the way we do science to turn the toy on the shelf into an everyday tool. Um, Louise, in the work that you do, what are your thoughts about adapting the scientific process itself in order to make better use of existing AI tools? I think there are a number of things that we can do um, to, to better understand what it is that our models are telling us. And I think one of the, one of the well, there are a couple of points. One of them is around um, improving the AI human interface so that we can better understand what our models are saying. And there are, because um, there are a range of explainable AI tools that exist, and we're already using many of them, partial dependence and ICE plots and all of this. But um, often you want to dig into your data a bit more than just that, and you want to understand, well, what happens when I look at the interaction between these two predictors? And, and all of more nuanced explanations of why is it that we didn't get the result that we were expecting in this case, or why do we get this particular outlier here? And I think that we can, um, we need sort of model agnostic um, 
uh, interfaces that allow us to, to do these explainable AI metrics in a more advanced way. So that's one thing that I think we need. And then perhaps another gap, at least in our area, is, is around um, causality and having better AI causal systems that can, because there are all kinds of statistic ways that we can look at causality between variables, but at the moment, the way that people are running global prediction systems or trying to uncover what are the drivers of extreme events um, we don't know if what we're seeing is co-occurrence of patterns in the data or if they're actually causal. And I think those are two areas that we need to improve. Neil, as both a scientist and an AI expert, what are your thoughts about how science could mod be modified? I think there's the, initially there's just the practical point that Charlotte made, that, that basically um, this is helping us to write code. And I think one of the sad... This is, there's a little bit of an irony going on here, is that I, increasingly I'm starting to use this provocation. The only profession I think we could probably get rid of would be software engineers. Yet, given the fact that software engineers are creating this technology, they don't seem to be saying that very much. But as, as Charlotte was sort of saying, it's like, well, it does write code pretty well. Now, it's, it's not there by any means 100%. But the reason, I think that's a really interesting, well, I like the provocation. It upsets my colleagues in the science department as well. Um, but I kind of think it's an interesting one because there's lots of answers why you might not be able to get rid of software engineers. And it's like, but fundamentally, all software engineers are trying to do is, you know, one of the things Louise just hinted at is sort of translate from the human to the computer, right? So the job of a software engineer is a human has this in their head the software engineer is a human, but they understand a bit about how computers work. So they're just trying to translate that and get the computer to assist. Now, if AI is doing anything, we should be able to get rid of the software engineer because the AI should be able to do that translation for us, right? So I think I'm not, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I think that that's a far more sensible thing to talk about and think about and to push back in the large tech companies who currently are the guilds of the software engineers and trying to own that space and provide generally pretty poor products overall. So it would be nice if they sorted their own ground out first before telling us they're going to fix climate change. Um, so that's my first sort of thing, extending a little bit from what Charlotte, that's what Charlotte said earlier. I mean, it's building on that sort of idea. But then I think there's a very other interesting thing that the notion of AI for science allows you to do. And I think that is scientific introspection. So the, the fact that you have this computational thing that is doing these things and is going to be a tool to help you, and it's almost like this sort of other intelligence, and there's some things it can do. For example, the notion of causality, I, you know, I'm, I think it's a really, really important area. But what do we mean, like, when we're saying, like, rising sea surface temperatures cause a hurricane? You know, there's something in there that's not written into the underlying physics, is it? There's some sort of interesting abstraction going on there. And, if, and we sort of all understand that straight out of the box, but how do we get a computer to understand that or recognize that or talk about that on our terms? What are we doing there? And you sort of increasingly, as you think about it, we're doing these abstractions all the time because we're not starting from like the standard model of physics and deriving proteins from that. These are things that sort of emerge naturally in these different domains. And I think it really... It's a really interesting way of trying to take a fresh look that as we try and do those causal things, you, you actually have to ask this question, well, what do we mean by those things as well? So at some one very basic level, really interesting opportunity for tools, for scientists to really get a much smoother interaction with the machine so that they can interact with the machine as an assistant, um, not as a dominant entity. But then this other sort of thing that through that process, rethinking what we mean very often, like, about what science is and what these abstractions are and where they're coming from. Charlotte, your, your thoughts. Do, do you see your science or those of your colleagues, uh, students, collaborators, do you see the science itself changing because of the existence of AI? I think, it, I mean, it, I, go, so I go back to the answer I gave before. It is a toy. Um, so did science change when we suddenly all had computers we could use to do stuff? Well, Yes and no. Yes, it changed because, you know, it, people like me sat at a desk all day doing this rather than stood at a bench doing this. Yep, trying to answer the same question. And so will it change it? Well, it changes it in the sense that it gives us another way of probing what we're trying to do, attempting to answer questions. It gives us 
things that we won't have to do anymore because it will hopefully do those for us. Does it fundamentally change it? No, because we want to ask questions we don't know the answer to. And so we're still going to want to think in the same way. And I think that's what both Louise and Neil were getting at. It's, you know, what, what would be fantastic is it, if it could help me do the thinking bit. Could it help me understand why this is this, how that works like that, how I would change that? What would be the next question I could ask? How could I actually change the world kind of thing? Um, and I think it will just become part of what we use every day. So I think it will change our, if you like, where we sit and how we do things Will it change what we actually want to do? I don't think so very much. Maybe I'll throw out um, an observation based on something you said, Charlotte, which was about the rapidity with which lots of science ends up being done. And when we're fast, we're not necessarily careful. I think the, the data-driven revolution that we're in really accelerates the pace of expectation amongst scientists both within industry and within academia. It's another fortnight, therefore we can publish another paper. Um, as somebody who is um, a great believer, as I get older, slow science, maybe those two things are causally related. What are your thoughts, each of you, about the slowness versus the pace at which scientific progress could be achieved? And are we seeing a speeding up unnecessarily of science because of our digital tools? Can I put you on the spot and start with you? I, I think it's kind of all this desire for slow science as you get older. It's not causal, <laughs> it's, it's a co-evolution. Um, uh, I, I think it's really interesting. I, I don't think the pace of science, there's something fundamental about humans' ability to assimilate information. And for that information to be assimilated, I think one of the beautiful things we have, if the thing becomes... If this thing somehow is emergent as known, then everyone can see from different sides that it is known. And so somehow we don't have to all tell each other this thing's got, I don't have to make it up because different people can try it and they'll all start using it. For example, some of the models Charlotte was talking about, if they genuinely, it, the press release doesn't tell you something. What tells you something is if in three years time, everyone is using that model. And that process takes a certain amount of time, no matter what people are doing in terms of publication. I mean, it's, the, the unfortunate thing is we've also overemphasized publication as a measure, particularly in machine learning, where it's become a ticket to enter companies and gain high salaries. That's not what publication was supposed to be for. That um, basically publication is no longer a way of telling if something works. It's just a sort of maybe something we have to summarize with large language models or something. Um, but the way of telling that something works is people don't talk about it, right? Because of course they're using it. You know, you can see that's true with all technologies that are functioning. People don't say, oh, we'll use computers to talk with each other later. They say, we'll call each other later. So we sort of need these technologies to get to the point, well, obviously you're doing that. And that will take a certain amount of time that will be slower than the, the fast science stuff indicates. And I feel that's the, progress of, that's the progress of science, when it's assimilated in our wider knowledge and it's taken for granted, not when it's claimed or the disease. So I don't think science... Um, I guess the other side to the question is, are we damaging that process in somehow? I, I, it's super hard to tell because there's so many effects with the increased amount of communication and, and we're certainly undermining existing scientific institutions, which used to be the mechanisms for doing that. Um, and to an extent, we're seeing this weird effect where um, nature is now like, what, 1,500 different journals because everyone's so desperate to get a nature branding around things. I'm not sure that's very positive either. It's this total disruption to what a journal is and was. Um, but it, you know, one's wary of a little bit of being the grumpy old man and sort of saying it was better before because, that, that it's, yeah, it's just different, isn't it? So it's, it's jury's out, I think. Uh, Louise, any thoughts? I think there are different components to this. Um, one of them is the speed of the, the AI ML models that we can build. And the other is the slowness and the time it takes to develop the data sets to, to build those models. And that's the part that we often forget is that your model is only as good as the data that goes into it. And I think you said something along those lines that the data is really what we need to, to generate the valuable insights. 
And some of our papers that have taken the longest is because um, you, can, you can generate global data sets easily with ML, but if you don't have the ground truth observations and, and pulling them together to create those ground truth data sets, um, your model is not going to be worth anything. So that is actually part of the slow science for us, is, is building the data sets that feed into the ML. Charlotte, any quick thoughts from you? I guess I'm less of a grumpy old man on this one. I think, um, I think it's exciting. And I think publication is changing dramatically. I think there's been loads of causes of that. It isn't just you know, the speed of this. It's to do with the concepts of open access. It's to do with the fact that the archive arrived and people started using it across multiple disciplines. So many things. And I kind of try and stay on the side of that is sort of amazing. It means that loads more information has become available. There's this, you know, and the speed at which I can observe what is changing in my field has gone up. And I find that really exciting. But I have to couple that against. That means we are going to need to find a way about how we measure what is good and that we don't waste our time repeating things that, you know, have become known to be failures because only one group knows they're a failure, but it's on the archive and 200 people are trying to replicate it kind of thing. So I kind of... What I, what I hope is a future state where we're not quite yet is we can maintain that excitement. There is, there is nothing wrong with running sometimes. It's really exciting watching people run really fast, but it's also really, really important that if you're going to use something in anger, you want to know it's really good. But I quite like being able to see that explosion. So I guess I think the world, the whole way we measure and think about whether we've done good science is going to change. I think publications for lots of reasons that have already been mentioned are going to are going to have to change what they look like and how we use them. And out of interest, uh, our uh, AI system uh, said uh, collaboration. AI should become a collaborator on the project, presumably a co-author as well, yeah. and, and maybe 10% of its time funded under full economic <laughs> costing. Um, the other thing I think is very interesting that we've not necessarily touched upon our AI system suggested that science across the world is not necessarily open in the sense that there is no open sharing of data and research methodologies, and there aren't any global standards associated with a lot of science that goes on. And that is a kind of that is where science could evolve in order to be better. I actually think that's a fairly interesting comment from our large language model. I won't dwell on that, but. Uh, it has come up with something interesting. So I think um, the final thing I would like to do would be to, um, if I don't mind starting with yourself, Charlotte, um, um, in your role in UKRI, but really to ask the questions about what steps could and should the UK take as a nation to strategically position itself in AI for science? I'm going to have to tread very carefully now. <laughs> no, I'll try and tread carefully and then leave lots of space for others to answer it. I think there are things that we have to remember about what we have and what we don't have. So one of the statements that should, you know, it's a factual statement. The volume of computing power that the private companies can access for this and you know, some of you might have seen the reports about the amount of money that Meta, for example, spends spent on GPUs in a year. Yeah, that is beyond the national capabilities, as far as I know, of any country in the world. Yep. That's just one year of their spend. Now, there are countries who might be doing more than I am aware of, just to be clear there. Um, but we are not in a world where we should think about this as the competition for us is to have build the biggest possible models on the biggest possible computers because that is, at the moment, unlikely to be a national capability. It's a private capability. So when you think about being at the front of this, what you're actually thinking about is how are you smarter? And by smarter, there's actually things that really matter. So we haven't really touched on it, but somebody, some people have done calculations about just how much electricity was burnt to train the large language models. And they, remember, they weren't trained once. So if you've been playing with the chat GPTs of the world or the Geminis of this world, they weren't trained once. They trained them a lot of times. Literally millions of pounds of electricity in a world where we should be worrying about some problems, about using lots of power. And the amount of power that is used every time you do a search on one of them. Yeah, it's not insignificant. 
to go and ask them a question. Now, I'm using those as examples because they're good examples for this. So actually, if we're thinking about you know, how we will be good at this, what we should actually be thinking about is how do we make these methods so that they power our science but don't at the same time, well, I could say destroy my budget, but what I should say is destroy the planet. Um, and think about them in that kind of way. They are not a, this limitless resource. Just using the computation doesn't take away the cost of what we're doing. So a lot of my answer about this is we're going to have to be clever because we're not going to win with the biggest possible you know, machine to run them on. Louise? Yeah, I think that point about being clever is, is at the heart of it because... Um, what we really need and what the UK is good at is, is literacy. Um, AI literacy starts from a very young age, making sure that um, children in schools have that critical mindset that they know what an LLM can tell them and when it might just be confidently telling them nonsense. And having that awareness, that critical thinking from the early age and then all the way through to advanced skills training at doctoral and postdoctoral level, which is what the UK is doing now with the, um, the Centers for Doctoral Training and the, the AI hubs. Um, so having, having that growing skill set um, through to advanced, advanced AI, I think, is one of the areas. Neil, your thoughts? Um, yeah, this is thinking I, something... I used to have a lot of roles in government advice around AI, none of which I have anymore. But So I'm just going to say some of the things that I would think of in those roles. And I, they reflect some of the things Charlotte was saying. Um, we have to be smarter. There used to be this thing, I can't remember, there's so many ministers, was it Freeman, that used to say science superpower but on a shoestring. Well, you're not going to... You know, people sort of... I, I, I find that a very interesting statement. The way you're not going to be world leading is by doing the same thing as everyone else with less resource. That's kind of like a recipe for being second or third um, or fourth or fifth. Um, and what's so interesting about the UK is we just have so many interesting advantages. And the way I try and do what, what Charlotte is talking about in terms of thinking smarter is just think, well, well, and it came to me when I was thinking about taking on this leadership of this AI role in Cambridge. One of my colleagues said, in warning me about what it's like to do leadership roles, there's many people who do them here probably very well, but they sort of said, if it were possible for a well-intentioned, intelligent person to change the way the University of Cambridge operates, it wouldn't operate the way it does. They call it their anthropic theory of the University of Cambridge. Now, I suspect that this might also be true of Oxford to some extent, not knowing the... Um, but I think it's not good enough. And, you know, as someone who wasn't in Oxford for most of my career, Oxford and Cambridge are most extraordinary places, Imperial as well, these leading institutions. They have incredible advantages, but they operate a sort of soft glass ceiling on what the rest of the country can do, because most people will, like me, when said, oh, would you like to come to Cambridge, will move. So any other sort of institution sticking its head up will get cut down. So on, on that sort of point, the, the reaction again to how being smarter, how does one deal with that? Because there's some sort of element of truth in that. Well, it must be that the first thing that smart, well-intentioned people try to change things when they get in positions of powers doesn't work for some reason. So we have to think different. We have to think of new ways of doing things. And that's not just, that, that's also, there's all levels. That's what Charlotte's going to have to do in uh, EPSRC. That's what DSIT's going to have to do. And I think the first one of those is we have to stop these sort of, of course, we're given very little resource in the country. And there is even, we, the result of getting little resource, it means we all fight over it. It's the reason the politics is so high is because the stakes are so low. We must stop that. And we have to work together across our leading institutions, as we're doing here, coming together as we do it across the Schmidt programs, to, to see further, to, to build on our geographical advantages, the advantages of the extraordinary students we get, absolutely outstanding students and fellows that we get, we don't get so much funding, but there's all sorts of interesting things we can do to be imaginative about how we move forward. And most of that is doing something that, you know, Cambridge and Oxford and Imperial will all like to say that they are leading institutions. Well, let's stop thinking that leading is being top of the tables in some way. Leadership involves showing the way forward and enabling others to follow. 
And as institutions, we are all in a position to do that within the UK. And we all must do that, or else we're going to get drowned. You know, not just, just in this area of big science and, and low resource, not just in AI. And I kind of feel that's the spirit of the way we're trying to conduct things across uh, Schmidt. And that's the spirit that we need to do things in many other areas. But it is hard. And that's not, I mean, also it's all this fancy stuff, but it is hard because, of course, people do need to want to move forward on their own. So they, we're in competition as well. But we need to, we need to think bigger than that because, because of the resource things, because we're not going to be able to compete with less resource. We have to compete by thinking differently and working differently and building communities that continue to be world leading. Fantastic. Um, and I'm going to open up for uh, questions in just a moment. Very briefly, our large language model really resonates on this question, um, commenting that um, there needs to be more investment in research. It's... <laughs> Is that something you said about telling us what we already know? It's clearly a well-intentioned intelligence. Yes. <laughs> there needs to be better education and training of science at early year stages um, in order to promote science. And we need to improve public-private partnerships, possibly in the way that, say, in Germany, with their things like Fraunhofer Institutes and, and beyond, and similar in uh, many other countries, that we need to do this in order to bring in some of the capacity of commercial partners and bring that in in confluence with, with academic partnerships. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you all very much. Um, we have got time for some questions and maybe some brief responses, possibly not from the larger language model. So questions from anybody. Um, there's somebody here in the front row that I saw, but I'm sure there are others. Thank you very much, everyone. This is really fascinating. I have a specific question for you, Charlotte, which is about data. I think one of the problems with data is that the incentives for people to gather it and to clean it are, are not always that high because you, you put your career making a beautiful data set and somebody else downloads it and generates a really high profile paper and gets to glory. And the question really is, is for funders like the UKRI, what are some ways you think they could incentivize the gathering of large data sets better? I think it's, it, it, yes, I, I sort of agree with your premise that people don't do it for various reasons. I actually think most people don't do it, it's a bad phrase, because they're lazy. Because the reality is, so my group has collected very large data sets in multiple places, and it's an enormous amount of effort. I'm sure that most of my and postdocs really dislike me as I'm trying to persuade them we're going to do this. And we put all of that data completely publicly, it's out, so everyone else can use it. Every antibody large language model is based off our data set. Actually, that's not quite true. I think there might be one now that isn't. But every other one, including all the ones in companies, because they've just taken our data and used it. But I still think it's probably the most important thing we did, even though we probably don't have the most high-profile papers, because other people have written better antibody language models maybe not, than we have. But I think it is so interesting to be the custodian of the data because you are the person who understands how it will work, what the problems are. You get to talk, I mean, because we did that, my group gets to talk to everybody about this. Everybody talks to us about that field. So I think there are massive advantages within this that allow you to collaborate, build things. You know, it, it's built some of the best collaborations we have, quite often into industry, actually, because... The data is freely available. They can do whatever they want, but they want to talk to us because we're the only people who actually truly understand the data sets. In terms of incentivizing, I think there are things that are starting to happen. We're starting to see it much more commonly that data sets have things like DOIs, um, which means they can be referenced in their own right. And I think that's, very, that's actually quite powerful because of the way we are, as an academic, you are measured. That allows you to do that. Changing the rules around things like the ref has a big impact as well. So making something like a data set and a allowable, for those of you who don't have to suffer the ref, just ignore this bit. Those of you who do, sorry. Um, but making that something that it is an allowable input into the ref, that's a massive incentive because, you know, if you did a data set well and it's, you know, literally they can pick up thousands and thousands of citations and everyone would say it changed the world. Well, that's a, you know, it's almost easier than doing the science that does that. 
painful, but doable in that sense. So I think there are opportunities there. I think it's more about incentives that are not financial and more about like the career ones that will improve your career. Sorry, trying to keep it short. Time for a couple more questions. Uh, Hi, there's somebody uh, at the quick back. Quick question about maybe for Professor Chalodin, open to anyone. So what is your experience with uh, large language models trained on scientific literature and scientific data to, you know, to answer, to try and answer scientific question, biological question. Where do you think we are and how are these system developing? Do you think this can be the future? So I'll answer very briefly because I suspect the others may know more than I do about this, but the it's very clear that those kinds of methodologies are very, very good at summarizing literature for you. So there's some very powerful, the, the one I'm most aware of, in-house systems in some pharma companies like GSK, where they've built it. So it summarizes literature very quickly. So they can search the literature and then it summarizes the abstracts without you having to go and find them all, pulls out all the papers that are similar to one another and really helps you do that kind of thing. They've also been used to try and pull specific types of information out of the literature. The one I would think about would be how do you perform chemical synthesis? And there it's proved it's really hard to get that out. Humans find it really hard to find that data. AI is not that much. In fact, it's probably worse at doing it, but can do it at a greater volume than we can. I'll hand across. <laughs> Neil, any thoughts? No, no. I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, a question uh, in the middle block there. Thank you very much for an excellent talk and excellent panel discussion. And for highlighting the need for model results to be, uh, uh, you know, based on reality, essentially. And it's very, very difficult to do this quite often, especially on very complex systems like climate, where uh, you can't do experiments which are controlled uh, to generate the right, um, uh, you know, correct data, for example. Now, how would you handle this? I mean, uh, by highlighting the... Uh, variability and uh, basically uncertainty in the uh, models or, you know, how would you approach this, basically? Address the subject. Um, I think there are multiple strands to answering that. Uh, I think that one of, one of the big challenges is around uncertainty quantification. And one of the problems there is that a lot of people are still using deterministic models and not probabilistic um, AI models. So we need to be encouraging increasingly the research groups to use um, more probabilistic methods so they, they can see what, how the uncertainty varies. Um, but then, yeah, of, of course, un understanding the, um, the biases in, in the data and the um, um, uncovering the relationships between the predictors and the target variable and the interaction between the predictors, as I was mentioning earlier, I think that you just need to really dig in and, and understand how all of that varies in, in the data. And it takes a lot of time to do it well. Thank you, Louise. And I know there was a big nod from both Neil and myself when you mentioned probabilistic models. So uh, um, we have time for one more quick question, uh, if anybody would like to ask. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. Um, so uh, first of all, thanks to all of you for your time. Um, so we heard quite a lot about the various problems with current AI systems, problems with data, lack of compute, and so on. Um, so my overall feeling after this session is that none of you kind of really believe that AI will be the main driver for the future of science. Um, so can, can you can you please comment on that? Like, did I get this wrong? Or like, what is the missing piece that we sort of need to solve for this to become a reality? So I, I could have a go at starting. I, I don't, I think it's just part of a wider ecosystem. I mean, as Charlotte, Charlotte's data collection is what's driven the ability to create AI, but actually people will start. And Pietro, Pietro Perona has been saying this in computer vision since like day one. It's all about data now. Increasingly, people will realize that they'll collect more data and do things. I, I, you know, I think it is a massive driver because of what Charlotte says. It's a new toy and it's making people think in different ways. So maybe, maybe we came across as too pessimistic. Well, Charlotte didn't. She, I thought she, she summarized it beautifully. I, I think it's but it's, it's not in isolation. It's not going to be sitting there inventing stuff. You know, it's a tool for humans. And that's why I prefer the term machine learning, because then it's clear it's like a tool, whereas AI makes it sound like it's going to be doing the sciencing on its own. Um, 
So I, I would say it's an enormous driver. I just like, I think that the way we make, get the potential out of anything is to be worried about the ways in which it will fail. And that's the way that we'll ensure that we get, because other people will talk about how brilliant it's going to be in the hype. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the word in there is, will it be the main driver for the future of science? That's a pretty big ask. Will it be a huge driver for the future of science? Yes. One of the ways to think about this is, I suspect everybody, all of you, at some point during today, you will have been using, we'll call it AI for the sake of argument, it will have done something for you. You might not know that right now, you might not realize, and that is the same thing to be true through science. It's going to be all pervasive. One of the things I like to say is that I suspect very soon there will barely be a grant that comes into UKRI that is in some way, it may or may not know it, is using AI. Now, that's just kind of cool. Is it the main driver? Well, no, the main driver for the future of science is really exciting questions. But is it really important? Yes. Thank you very much indeed for the excellent questions. I just want to extend my thanks to our panelists, Neil Lawrence, Louise Slater, and Charlotte Dean for uh, wonderful commentary, insightful thoughts. Thank you all so very, very much. Thank you.